Hey, what's going on there, everybody? It is D Oaks. I want to welcome you all to 30 Minutes with D Oaks. Listen, I got a special guest that I've been trying so hard to get for so very long. But here we are. It's a special day. This is a special edition, yo, of 30 Minutes with D Oaks because it's National Single Parent Day here in the U.S. All right. So it couldn't have came out better. You know, God always have his way, right? Mm -hmm. So look, um, I got to tell you all a little bit about this special guest right here. She's a single mother of three. MPP of Kitchener Centra, right? Mm -hmm. You probably would, if you're from Canada, um, you should be familiar. Um, she's a critic critic of anti-racism colleges and universities so we talking high level yo we, we're not doing we're not doing the average today we're not doing that on national single parent win day uh notice how i put that win on there y'all but listen she's a community leader most importantly now listen to this she's a community leader with love i need you all to understand who we have right here, that is Laura May Lindo. Welcome, welcome to 30 Minutes with Dio as well. Oh, thank you for having me. And thank you for being persistent. It's not easy, absolutely. but we did it. We did absolutely. it. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so Laura, um, you have so much going on. I do my research. I feel like you have days on days this is not a read through there's not a quick yeah. you know research on yourself which means you're putting in a lot of work so i myself and i'm sure the viewers would like to know what inspired what's the makeup of lore you know what what happened um for you to be inspired to put this type of work in as far as your single parent journey and uh what led up to um, it's a good question. I think it actually, my journey starts with where you ended, um, yeah. loving my community. When you love your community, you, you tend to put your name into um, spaces and places to try and protect them at, at any cost. And so um, my, my kids, my two older kids, their father passed in 2012. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I had been navigating life as a single mommy for quite some time, but because they were so young, they were only seven and four at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I kind I wasn't in a position to not find a way to keep sort of moving us forward and making sure that we were all protected. Um, my youngest came in 2015. And at that time, I, oh, look, he's shown up. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> there he is. Hey, little fella. He is eight years old. Um, and so he arrived on the scene in uh, 2015. And by that time, I was working in the university out in Waterloo Region, which is um, about an hour and a half, two hours away from Toronto. Most people in the States know Toronto cool. uh, in Ontario, right? So you get a sense mm -hmm. of where I am. And uh I, in, in the role I was at, at the university, I held the senior most role to do anti-racism work. All of my background is in education and helping um, black, brown, indigenous kids navigate our school system. And I, we had had a pretty rough go at the university, a number of incidents that had actually made it into the media. And so the university kept putting me forward to talk about this. And again, even though life at home was hard, I mean, it's me and three kids now, um, there wasn't really a, a time for me to choose not to keep doing that work. Because if I didn't work for my community and ensure that we address racism properly in the community, my kids were gonna be in trouble for their future. And so we ended up hosting, my little team hosted a conference, a national we called it a summit on the status of race and racism on Canadian university campuses. Mm -hmm. I wanted to demonstrate that there was a connection between what was happening on campus and the political sphere. So I invited politicians. And once I did that, they started asking me to put my name on a ballot. And once they started asking me to put my name on a ballot, 
I had to have a real discussion with myself about um, how committed I was to community work. And as hard, again, as it was to be a single mama doing all of that, um, I decided we'll give it a shot. And I cannot tell you how much community has come out to support me because when I am loving them so much that I'm putting myself into the throes of politics, um, they are loving me right back, trying to hold my kids and, and me and my family uh, with love and care. Wow, wow. I did not realize that racism was such a, um, you know, serious and active thing currently taking place in Canada. I didn't, I didn't know that. I know a lot of people wow. don't. And you know what's interesting? In Canada, when we talk about racism, folks mm -hmm. usually look to the states and they read stats in the U.S. and they yeah. pretend like this isn't happening here. But we have a huge push out rate of black kids, um, indigenous kids that are pushed out of our school system way higher than their white peers. Um, and that still happens today. And we have the, an overrepresentation of black, brown and indigenous folks in our um, prisons and jails. Like all of the same things that are happening in the US are actually happening in Canada. And the hardest thing is that the myth about Canada is we were the end of the Underground Railroad. So people are like, mm -hmm. people came here to flee the horrors of slavery and, um, and any kind of discrimination in the U.S. But the reality was they were put on horrid lands here. Um, they had their communities demolished. If you look up Africville in Nova Scotia, um, their community was already having to live rough because they put them in bad lands, no running water, all sorts of stuff. And then one day the community was like, oh, we don't want to see this anymore, demolished it. And so that kind of history people don't talk about. So part of my job now, when I'm sitting at Queen's Park is in the center of Toronto where we do our work for the province, so for Ontario, yeah. I bring up those stories and I make those connections. So it's quite, it's quite fascinating. And it's quite interesting to see the impact that that has on my kids, right? Because they, again, it's, it's a toss up. I'm taking time away from them to be in this public role. Um, mm -hmm. But they now know that it's possible for us to be courageous and speak back to the system and fight for things so our communities are safe. Yeah, yeah, it's service. It's yeah. service, you know, and what's service. service is the sacrifice. That's and um, I definitely uh, believe that if you if you don't if you're called to that assignment and you don't take it on, uh, it might feel comfortable, but it's it's got to be one of the most selfish acts um, that you can do. So um, I told I told you viewers uh, this going to be a impactful one. That's to say, <laughs> yes. Um, listen, uh, Laura, you you speak a lot about education you know yeah. universities how important is it for a single mother to be educated during these times um it is it is critical that we are educated um in order to be able to do what i know our hearts want which is to have our kids have a better life than we have had. So if we've struggled, we don't want them to struggle. But what I think might be a little bit different in the way that I have thought about education, just based on my, I did my master's and PhD in education. Um, and I was focused on kids that were pushed out of the system. And then after, you know, failing English two or three times, they couldn't get to university, they couldn't get to college, they decided they wanted to make a change. So I would teach those kids. So because that is my backdrop, um, I believe that being educated doesn't always happen in our schools. Being educated is understanding the systems around us. So if you have a better understanding that, um, you know, if you do X, then the system's going to come at you with, with Y, that type of education, teaching our kids about how the systems around us actually function is, um, is critical. And that actually keeps them safe. And as ominous as that might sound, the reality is that our regular um, education system, thank you, 
my son just gave me a cookie. So. Hey, listen, I know you enjoying this episode right now. Me too. But listen, I got to share my new 12 month single parent coaching program with you. Now, look, you might be a single parent. You are really suffering with your self-esteem, right? You're trying to get your confidence together. Or you might be that single parent right now. The schedule is beating you. You know what I'm saying? Like it's school, it's work, it's homework, it's cooking, it's everything. It's just chaotic. You might be that single parent, right? Or you might got the finances and everything in order, but now you the single parent that's trying to figure out the six steps to go from being a single parent to a married parent. Listen, if you any one of those single parents or another type of single parent, I need you to do this. Shoot me an email to bookdoaks at gmail.com. Share your brief story and let's take it from there. Apparently, that comment was extremely important. Yeah, yeah you're doing, um, doing the work. Both of y'all are doing the work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love but it. But I, I think that our regular education system tries to um, teach us that that kind of lived experience of like how systems actually function in the real world, like what's really happening around us isn't right. important. And so then when we don't have a mainstream, like those mainstream educational credentials, we start to look down on ourselves. And as soon as your internal dialogue starts to go sideways, then you can't do the work that you need to do. So yes, education, Mm -hmm. hugely important. But understanding how that educational system works is way Mm -hmm. more important than just navigating the system and just sort of believing whatever they say in the textbooks. And, and, and that, that, that made that, leads me to this question so if you have the single the single mom who wasn't that educated herself right and Mm -hmm. she's trying to implement a a teaching system educational system as you spoke of just being aware of how the rules how the laws work how the economic system works how did how how would you direct her far as beginning that mm-hmm. system as far as laying the infrastructure, how, how would you lead her? So I, I tend to start everything backwards. What matters the most is what you tell yourself in your head. And so there are reasons that um, Black, in the States, Latino, um, Indigenous community members are pushed out of the mainstream education system. There are mm-hmm. things that happen, like poverty, that pushes you out. When you have to make a choice about making a dollar so that you can eat or you're, you know, you're helping your mom, your dad, whatever, you're helping them to raise the rest of the family yeah. or go to school and learn about something or have somebody yell at you and say that you're worthless, you get pushed out of that system. That's that the system wants you to believe that that was your fault, that you were not mm-hmm. strong enough to stay there. When the reality is the system should never have treated you that way in the first place. And so the very beginning for me is always, what is the dialogue in your head? That single mummy that you're talking about, who feels as though she is not educated, but is surviving, still woke up that morning, still got up, still figured out what to do with their children, still went to work, still did this, did that, is educated. And somehow we have to start with recognizing that that bit of education is actually valid. Then once you start to understand that, all of a sudden the world can open up with the other kinds of things that you can do, whether you decide to go back to school and try and get whatever credits you need to do whatever, whether you realize like in Canada, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but in Canada, um, once you turn 21, you can actually access our college and university system as an adult. And so they don't, it doesn't look at your transcripts from high school, but they don't talk about that. So they make you feel like, well, you didn't get through high school, so you're never going to be able to go there, right? Any, that's never the case. You can always do things. There's always an exception. Everything is just impossible until one person does it. It's just a matter of trying to figure out who to talk to and who can help to guide you through that system. And so that single mummy who is doing their best with what they have, I always want to first tell them you are valued, you matter, and you are educated. The question is, what is it that you know that you need to get out there? And what are some of those gaps? And let's help you fill those gaps so we can get you to that vision, 
But when you start with, oh, I'm not educated because I don't have the systems vision of education, then you tend to stop trying and yeah. become the stereotype they want. I just don't want us to be the stereotype that they want. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely. We, we've, seen, we've seen that story way too often. Oh, too much. Now, and one of those things that you're speaking of, um, very, very important things we need to be aware of, um, like the economic system that's taking place, right? And you speak about the um, housing crisis. Yeah. Um, talk, talk to me about the housing crisis uh, that's currently taking place out there uh, in Canada. So we had um, the, we were already having a struggle with folks that were street involved. So there was a rise in homelessness all across um, the province, and I would argue across the country, but my role yeah. is just looking in Ontario, right? Okay. And we couldn't get the government to take seriously the need for an anti-poverty strategy, like a strategy that would help everybody helps the most vulnerable first. I'm convinced of that. If you focus on the most vulnerable, everybody thrives. If you focus on the folks that are already doing okay, then you're forgetting a whole population of people. Mm -hmm. And so the, house, the, the um, homelessness crisis was getting worse and worse. And then all of a sudden we had a weird situation happen with our um, housing when it came to folks that were trying to buy houses. So now all of a sudden you're talking about folks with means who are no longer able to use their money to buy the home of their dreams, like a single detached home or whatever, and mm -hmm. families that, that were struggling. And because we were talking to folks that were in um, sort of that higher socioeconomic bracket, people started to pay more attention to what was happening in our, in our uh, economic climate that wasn't letting them access. In the midst of all of that, because again, the focus was on folks that had money, because you need to have money to have your down payment, or have a, a, a sort of plan to try and figure out that down payment. Yeah. The people in the middle, the folks that were renting, um, the folks that were on social assistance. So if they had a disability and they were getting help from the government or um, during the pandemic, everything shut down here as well. And so a lot of people lost jobs so that they were on social assistance while they were trying to figure out where they could work. Yeah. Um, those folks, were in a pickle because we, we realized that a lot of the landlords that were here decided they wanted to sell their houses for astronomical amounts to anybody who would buy them. So they were finding ways to sort of circumvent, the, like go through the laws to get rid of their tenants so that they could sell these houses. So all of a sudden, a house that was originally bought for like 125,000 was going for 500,000, 600,000, 700,000, 800,000. And houses that were supposed to be for like a, a family with maybe one or two children was going for over a million dollars. And so what we're seeing right now in our housing crisis, we don't, the government's not putting money into supportive housing or public housing. So those places are falling apart and nobody cares. And honestly, with my equity portfolio, the majority of the people in those spaces are black, brown, indigenous that are living in the social housing units. So nobody is caring about their safety or their, you know, making sure there's not mold in their house, making sure the water is safe, et cetera. Um, the folks that are being pushed out are now finding themselves on the streets. I hear people that are having no choice but to live in their cars and they're still working. Like that's the other piece is that it's not that myth that, oh, they're street involved, they're not working. That's not what's happening. They just cannot afford anything because the prices have skyrocketed. And so we've been proposing a bunch of, of things to sort of support people. But when I think about, like we're here talking about single parents, when I think about the dreams that we have of having a home that we can give to our child, like many of us hope that we can do that, with the housing crisis as it is, it's making it harder and harder for, for people to actually have that dream. And so that, that has become even worse now because the cost of like food has gone up. And so people, like the reality is people are struggling. And what I do know is that when the pandemic brought the world to its knees, 
whether you want to believe that it was real or not, whether your particular government did the right thing or not, it doesn't matter. The point is the world stopped and all sorts. Welcome to singleparentswin.com. This online shopping experience was put together specifically for you, the single parent. That's right. See, listen, we have children's merch, adult merch, victory hats and winter caps ebooks and so much more see this is where fashion meets purpose it's of people that had the means to be able to make decisions jumped in and started to do all sorts of stuff there was like a pause in the planning of how the world was going to work and who was going to be the focus and it was not the most vulnerable and it was not the people that are navigating poverty it was all sorts of other people that could change like they could take that opportunity to develop this piece of land over there now all of a sudden they're going to put up houses that nobody can afford right so it got i got very heated there because when i see my community not being able to thrive it makes me, i have things to say <laughs> yeah. i felt it i felt it and 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 you really touched me there um wow and this what i need single parents to understand and all of those that are struggling during these trying times mm -hmm. i need you to understand these times will come around again yes they're oh coming again this is yeah. not you know because i'm gonna tell you laura like the mindset i'm so grateful you know that god has blessed me with this mindset and this understanding at this time with what's happening it's always a storm you're coming yeah. in a storm you're just getting out of a storm or you're on your way to a storm <laughs> it's going to happen again yeah so the best thing you can do i'm talking to you single parents uh specifically right now is prepare for the storms they're coming yeah, yeah. you know so this is not a this is not a one and done yo <laughs> this is mm -hmm. going to happen again um it's happened before whether, we may not have been around to see it, but it's happening, you know, yeah. so whether you're going to be around to see it or not, your children will, your grandchildren will. Yeah. So let's start preparing. Let's document processes. Um, so our children and our grandchildren, they will be prepared. If not, that's it. <laughs> um, that's I, it. I wanted to definitely get that out there because you touched me with that one. And I'm just thinking like, wow, this is not the last time right <laughs> no and you know what from a from a spiritual space so i happen to be a, a political figure that has a very strong sense of spirituality and i brought it into the work that i've done so when i'm doing public talks i talk about because i think we need to connect to each other as spirit in okay. order to be able to feel like we can help each other and the, and again the way the system operates is it wants us to dehumanize each other so that we can say, oh, I need this and you fight for that. And I don't want to do that. So from a space of spirit, I always remember, I think it was Oprah. I'm pretty sure it was Oprah Winfrey. I know I'm going there. Sorry, folks. But I'm pretty sure it was Oprah that was, ha she was doing an interview of some kind. And she said the, that God whispers in your ear and then gets louder and louder and louder when you don't listen to those lessons until whoop whops you upside the head right Every time. and i feel it's the same thing when it comes to these bigger crises because these are human crises the pandemic did not just take down one little corner of the universe it took us all down and we were all at different levels of preparedness to deal with it and then we had choices about okay my little area is isn't doing amazingly well but much better than over there am i going to help and for a large part of the countries the decision was not really going to help so much right like i was hearing stories of some some of the the uh tests that we were sending for instance to folks that some of them were expired so we were saving good stuff for us and bad stuff for them. like what is that about if we're if we are thinking from a place of spirit, we have to help everybody. And when we think about the amount of economies that exist in the world in the countries around the world that are based on immigration, if you don't help a country over there, then when you open up your your borders for immigration with your immigration policies, because now you're going to 
bring in newcomers to do whatever. You're not bringing in people that are okay because you didn't bother to help them. So, so I just think I'm with you. All of that to say I'm with you. If we could be more loving in our leadership, then we can help more people. And that loving leadership happens in my home just as much as it happens outside. Even as a single parent, even with all the barriers, even with all the mistakes I make. Because let me tell you, I, I clean up real nice, but I have my moments, right? <laughs> but if I can just be courageous enough to say, folks, I was dealing with heavy things. I am so sorry. Let's regroup and start fresh today. That makes a difference for my kids. And that lets them know that they, when they're adults, can also be courageous enough to admit when they've, you know, they've gone left when they should have gone right. They've gone up when they should have gone down. But we can make the change. Today can be the day that we make that change. Well, well said. Well said, Laura. Laura, what you think about getting into a game? We we like to play a game here on 30 Minutes with D.O.S. Uh-oh. Um, because... Me, myself, I'm a huge fan of quick thinkers. You know, when your back's against the wall, you know, you got to make some things happen. <laughs> you know, you know, you know how to put it together real quick, you know, on a snap or however. I don't know what they say out there in Canada. <laughs> you do it fast, you know, but what do you think about that? OK, I can play games as long as I don't have to remember people's names. Oh, no, we're we not. We're not, not, we, not those we, kinds of games. Names. No, we're not trivia. Not. So the game, so the game is called Rapid Oaks, right? Okay. So what's going to happen is I'm going to give you a word. I want you to tell me the first thing that comes to mind when you hear that word. Ooh, I like that game. Okay, bring it. You see, see, we ready. We ready now. Yeah, we ready. First word, time. Needed. Second word, community. Love. Third word, marriage. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to elaborate? <laughs> Shall I elaborate upon which one? <laughs> Time. So I'll do all three. Well, Time. Well, oh, okay, which okay. one? I'll I can do all three. I'll be I'll fast. I'll say marriage because you said interesting. It's interesting. So time needed and i think because that's always what we're saying in our head we need more time we need more time we need more time yeah. um the second community was love of course because that's what i it's just what i feel in my heart i didn't yeah. say your name Jaden. and the last was marriage interesting i think interesting because if if you are two folks two people that are committed to the same kind of way of being in relationship with each other, it yeah. can be amazing. But sometimes I don't think that we spend enough of the, the time ah like ahead of marriage. Like yeah. that's, a, that's a commitment that you've made. And we don't necessarily spend the time asking the tougher questions before stepping into that commitment. We sort of go on what we assume that person is going to do or not do. And a lot of that is because we're fearful, like we're afraid to have that hard conversation. And so it, I find it interesting that we can jump very quickly into something that's such a big commitment. Um, and then other times you can feel it and you can know, but oftentimes when you feel it and you can know ahead of time, you have had a, a, you have a relationship that is open enough to have that conversation. Cause at the end of the day, the easy parts of any relationship, they're easy. Right. What really matters about the quality of the relationship is what happens when everything breaks down. Like, how do you engage when there's a fight? How do you engage when, you know, when the world around you starts to collapse? How, that's what we saw with the pandemic. When the right. government said to us, stay at home with your people. <laughs> <laughs> people had questions about their choices for sure. right for sure. and so that i think that's why interesting is what came to mind and um before i ask this question mm -hmm. national single parent day is is it national single parent day in canada do you do you guys have that as well or is that just a u.s thing so we don't have that but you know what's yeah. fascinating 
Okay. On March 21st, mm -hmm. we we celebrate and commemorate the international the UN's International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So that's what I'm doing on the 21st. Wow. Um, but at the Single Parents Day, I thought it was. I did a quick Google check because I was like, "What? <laughs> Another day to have cake?" That's what I thought. But that's not what that day's about. <laughs> it's not a cake day, <laughs> friends. It's not a cake day. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you this last question to wrap the game up. This one is always the one that moves everybody for the rest of the week. Okay. I think you're going to find out why. If you had to pick one, love or trust, what would it be? See, for me, it would have to be love because if I truly had love, like, I mean, the real deal, trust would yeah. be part of it. Like, I don't think that you can separate out trust from love. Mm. But that, that said, I decided, this is so interesting to me. I had decided that, um, yeah, go ahead. I had, he now has to have a snack in case you're following what's <laughs> happening in my house. This needs a granola bar. And my answer was yes. Um, so I decided a few weeks ago that I would start a radio show and the radio show is actually about um, leading with love because people were asking me as a leader in the community, I was the first black person elected to represent either the province or the country in my area. And so that was in 2018. So a lot of people have asked like, how did you get there? What's your leadership style, et cetera. And so my entire radio station, I've been interviewing all these people about what does it mean? Because I used to always say, I think that I lead from a place of love. I care about these communities and folks nodded, but nobody really talked explicitly about what that looked like. And so I have, my idea of what love is and what it means has grown because of the people I've, I've spoken with and trust can't be taken out. If there is no trust, there is no love. If you don't trust somebody, right, or you don't trust a system, you can't love it. But you can have trust and not necessarily love everything that's happening around it. Do you know what I mean? For sure. So I think it would, ha it would have to be love, but it would have to be authentic love. Not that fake love that, you know. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I really, I really appreciate that because um, trust, what I find with most single parents uh, that I've interviewed, um, and I see it more as a, um, as a defensive, you know, uh, answer when they say trust, yeah. you know, and I, I get it so often, but you did well, you did very well <laughs> on the game, uh, Rapid Oaks. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, you you was kind of hesitant there, uh, but um, you know about playing the game, but because I didn't know if it was a real game. Like, <laughs> what do you know about American trivia? And then I would be like, I don't want to look like a fool. <laughs> of, oh, course not, of course not. I wouldn't <laughs> do that to you. So check it out, y'all. This new segment on Thirty Minutes with Dios is called the Single Parent of the Week. Now, this week on 30 Minutes with Dio's, the single parent of the week happens to be a single mother of two boys out of the great Cleveland, Ohio. Her name is Charlize Freeman. Now, look here, man. Here's why Charlize happened to be the single parent of the week. She changed the game completely, y'all, for where some would say the sweet 16. Now, her oldest boy just turned 16 years old, right? Happy birthday to her son, right? Here's what Charlie's did to change the game. He recently had a high, high interest. He let her know he wanted to be a chef and he wanted to be uh, in a business program. So actually there were two programs that was taking place for business and to be a chef, right? He applied for both and didn't get in either. Now, Charlize paid attention, you know, to his interests. They speak about it a lot. He speaks about real estate. She said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to surprise my son with three 
I say one, two, three properties of his own so he can start his generational wealth right here, right now at 16 years old. And not only that, she gift him with $10,000 to begin the operational process with these properties. Now, the gifts itself isn't what makes Charlize the single parent of the week right here on 30 Minutes with Dio's. It's the fact that she gets it. She could have just said, here's a car, throw him some car keys. Happy sweet 16. She could have just threw him a lavish party. But instead, Charlie said, I'm going to give him my son an asset that will outlive him, but will benefit him and benefit this last name forever. That's why that mindset, that's why Charlize Freeman is the single parent of the week. Um, now, tell me this. You have an event coming up on April 1st, correct? Yes. Um, yes. Let's talk about that. The power of connection. Uh, we're running short on time, so you can briefly share uh, the power of connection with everyone and how they can join this free webinar, right? Yep, absolutely. So in 2012, my partner of nine years passed. He was diagnosed with leukemia. Um, first diagnosed when my our eldest was three months and then relapsed when my youngest was just seven days. Um, and so I, I, we, I was raising these little people as a single parent who was grieving herself. I was raising kids that were grieving. And so I actually did a parenting course uh, through the Jai Institute um, to learn how to support my kids. And what I realized after that course was that what really mattered as a parent, whether I was single or not, was yeah. connecting in real ways with my kids. So I put together the three steps that we use to get from this place of loss and grief. And loss is big. It could be a pet that's lost. It could be, you know, you see things that are happening in the world around us that make us grieve even for others' families. Um, kids have questions. And so I put together uh, the three steps that we walked through to try and get into a space of healing. And on April 1st, I'm going to do a live webinar to talk to folks about the course. Um, there's a bigger course that's available as well. And I've got a little coupon for um, folks that want to just try it out. The first 15 people will be able to try the course out for free. Um, and if you go to any, I, I can actually share with you the link so that they can connect and, and register. Um, but I will be putting it out very soon on my website, which is Laura May at Laura May Lindo.com. That's my email and Laura May Lindo.com is my website. So just my full name, making it easy. <laughs> Thank you, parents. There you have it. Um, let's get over there right away. Get registered. Um, you see, this is just a teaspoon of what you're going to get um, when you really connect with Laura. Laura, um, I couldn't thank you more for um, joining 30 Minutes with D. Oaks. Uh, this, I wish this was like three hours with D. Oaks, <laughs> you know, but it's a special edition, special, special, special guest. I want to thank all the viewers. Um, Laura, did you have any last words? No, I just want to say, go out there, love people up, love up your communities, love your children, give them extra hugs. Things are hard outside, but I think the power of love is something that we cannot deny. In the name of love. Mm -hmm. wow. Listen, I need everybody to remember this right here. When single parents win, we all win. Yeah. I'm the Oaks, um, and I'll see you all next week, same time, same place.
Now, I know you're feeling real special after watching that special edition of 30 Minutes with Dio's. Shout out to Laura May Lindo. Man, such an amazing conversation. Now, look, it's about that time that Dio's give you my three takeaways from this conversation. Now, number one has got to be that at some point, you, not just Lori, you are going to need to have an uncomfortable and real conversation with you in order to elevate to the next level. Number two, I need y'all to know this right here. Number two, we got to understand that these times we're in right now, whether your thing is, it's difficult to pay for where you live. The cost of living is hitting you. Whether it's, you know, every time you go in a supermarket, it's the food. You're like, damn, what's going on? Why the food's so high, right? You know, inflation and all this other stuff. Just like the Great Depression. These times we're in will come around once again. The question is, will you be prepared for what we're dealing with right now the next time right now comes around number three y'all you know marriage as Laura mentioned is a commitment but this is how Dio's feel marriage is a level beyond commitment it's the highest level and that level is called a covenant marriage is a covenant under god now i say that to say this the fact that you think marriage is just a commitment or marriage is just something that many or some say you're supposed to do to show your love Maybe that's the reason. And that thinking is the reason that the divorce rate is at 52% in America. I'm D.O. Show. And I'll see y'all right here next week, same time on 30 Minutes with D.O. Y'all be good.